This is an unironic video. Everything stated is my genuine opinion. I just felt the need to say that because everything else I make is a satirical shit post. Hmm, what's this? A Japanese show about Japanese high schoolers in Japanese high school. I'm sure this is a perfectly normal show with nothing that interesting going on. I'm just gonna pop this in a magical movie machine and uh, we're gonna see what this animation uh, has for us. Hello, Evelyn. How are you? Fine, thank you. Oh my god! Uh, I wish I were a bird. I'm charmed. Azumanga Daio is a comedy manga serialized by Kiyohiko Azuma in the monthly magazine Dengeki Daio, an anime produced by JC Staff in 2002, and a series viewed by only the coolest kids on the block for the last 20 years. I love Azumanga Daio with every fiber of my being. I live and breathe it. It's a series that I've read more than any other series I can think of, mostly because it's shorter than most of what I've read, and it's a show that I can view any time of the year and binge watch without feeling any kind of boredom. Stating exactly why I'm so drawn to the series, however, is a lot more difficult to do than simply proclaim. At the surface, this really is just about some Japanese girls who went to high school, and some people who actually sit through it end up hating it by the time it's over. Others, however, come out entranced by it. Like there's some unexplained science that draws them towards the series and coerces them to repeatedly come back to revisit it. It's a cultural footprint that seeps into our subconscious or even into our very surroundings when we least expect it. Dude, I fucking love Azumanga Daio. It's, my, it's my favorite anime. I love it. I'm definitely not alone in my admiration. Even in recent years, there exist things like a Twitter account dedicated to posting random screenshots of the show every half hour. There's consistent fan-made content being produced over 15 years since the series concluded. The fact that I can still discover degenerate fan art on DeviantArt for it proves that the series is far from forgotten. The show has amassed a cult following on the internet, and its characters and most memorable scenes have resonated in online history and culture for almost two decades. Every single ironic weeaboo fag that ever used the phrase waifu owes the foundation of their terrible joke to Azumanga Daio. My waifu. But I'm not here to discuss how memes built the reputation for a show. This is not a JoJo discussion. This, my friends, is a dissection of Azumanga Daio, and why I place it on the shelf containing the greatest anime and manga of our times. Plenty of people take a look at a show like Lucky Star and Nichi Joe, which are already pretty popular examples of a slice of life show, and dismiss them as boring or intolerably dull. Sadly, a majority of the people who make these tired complaints are anime fans who stick solely to more fast paced shows extending beyond a single season, which is basically every modern shonen. And no, I'm not here to shit on people who like shonen anime. I'll suck off One Piece all day and admit that shows like JoJo are indeed very enjoyable. But the slice of life genre brings its own set of charms and enjoyability to the table that's hard to find anywhere else. What exactly is a slice of life? Well, according to the infinite source of knowledge that is Wikipedia, it's a depiction of mundane experiences in art and entertainment. However, Robin E. Brenner states that the genre is more akin to melodrama than drama, and finds itself entering the realm of absurdity due to the extensive amounts of dramatic and comedic events occurring at a fast pace. Basically, a slice of life should highlight the aspects of daily lives for a particular audience while utilizing both humor and the unique capabilities of animation to mix reality with ridiculousness. You ever heard the phrase Lynchian? It refers to a piece of media that blends features of reality with surrealism through sound and imagery. In a way that might be a bit of a stretch to say, slice of life shows demonstrate just how boring our daily lives truly are by creating an absurd tone for their show with over-the-top characters, situations, and concepts. So let's apply this to Azumanga Daio. I already noted that humor is an important element in most slice of life shows, and Azumanga Daio is indeed first and foremost a comedy. In fact, the original manga is written in four panel form, the Japanese equivalent of a newspaper comic strip. This allows for comedic timing and condensed storylines to play a significant role in telling jokes. Because of this, Azumanga Daio has a very unique way of making jokes and being humorous, which I believe is translated as well as it possibly could be in its anime adaptation. 
Some people criticize the pace and style of the anime, including the author of the manga itself, Kiyohiko Azuma, but I think this is just because of how unusual the adaptation of the four-panel form really was. The fast-paced dialogue and exchanges in the manga became more slow and drawn out in the anime, which was most likely a change added to prevent scenes from swapping at a pace too rapid for anyone not on cocaine to keep up with. Imagine if you were watching an episode of Charlie Brown and every 20 seconds you're in a different scene with different characters and very little happening that relates to previous scenes. This is probably what a more accurate adaptation would have felt like, but that's just my theory. Episodes of the show are characterized by momentary pauses, random breaks in dialogue, cutaways that have little to nothing to do with the previous scene, slow reactions from the characters, and repetition. If you're wondering what I mean by repetition, I mean something like this. But as my 11th grade English teacher taught me, repetition, like any literary device, is a tool. It's used to demonstrate an idea or influence the reader. In Azumanga Daioh's case, the repetition is just one of many tools in the show's arsenal for creating comedic situations. Another one of those tools are running gags, which run rampant throughout the series. For example, the character Sakaki absolutely loves cats and dogs, but none of them seem to love her back. There's a neighborhood cat that she encounters every day on her walk to school that she tries to pet, but every single time the cat just bites her. Each time a scene like this appears, you already know what's going to happen, but somehow that makes the eventual punchline retain its humorousness through the suspense and the build-up to what we're already expecting. Sometimes I'll put a spin on running gags like these, which obviously adds a new layer of comedy to the joke. But how about the whole absurdity aspect of Slice of Life we brought up earlier? Well, Azumanga Daio has more absurdity in it than my existence. There's the entire character of Osaka, whose daydreams of airheaded nature inspire some of the most ridiculous scenes in the show. There's the teacher Kimura who, after establishing that he loves high school age jailbait, retains the same open-mouthed expression and creepy personality for every scene he subsequently appears in. However, throughout the series his status as a joke perverted character is turned on its head, as it's revealed he not only has a loving wife and daughter, but also cares about being charitable and being respectful. That whole spin in itself is a bit absurd in relation to character tropes. And of course, there's also the repeated thought Sakaki has where she imagines her classmate Chiyo's father is a yellow cat who strongly urges people to eat their tomatoes. Chiyo, eat your tomatoes. Yes! I just love tomatoes! Your love or hate isn't the issue. Eat your tomatoes, Chiyo. Mm -hmm. How is it? Is it good? Is the tomato good? Mm, it's delicious! Every single scene with this cat is the best thing ever put to screen. From what we've seen so far, Azumon Gadayo demonstrates the key elements of a good slice of life. Dramatic comedy revolving around ordinary life, and the occasional absurd tone to disrupt the dull affairs of the world. But is this all it takes to make a slice of life series impactful? No. Many have implemented this formula in the past, but weren't able to leave any major lasting impression. Not on me, at least. Allow me to segue into the true force that makes Azumanga Daioh excellent. I don't care what concept, story, animation, or any other feature the anime or any piece of media in general exhibits. If the characters it tries to sell aren't being sold well, I am not going to buy it. Into the trash it goes! Some slice of life shows do nothing but develop the characters within them, and it's those that survive the test of time. Azumanga Daioh's ability to reign in the hearts of many for so long is for this very reason. To do its efforts justice, allow me to outline each of the central characters and how they manage to capture those hearts. Let's begin with Sakaki. I would call her the main protagonist, but I can't since Azumanga Daioh doesn't focus on one character over the other. It focuses on the group of friends we see as if they all form one character in itself. Any of the girls could be labeled the protagonist. Except Kaorin. She's just a lesbian. However, it's important to note that each of our main characters possesses a defining trait and embodies a certain archetype in anime. I'll explain what each of those archetypes are and just how perfectly implemented they are. Sakaki's initial appearance paints her as the cliché, quiet, introverted girl that weebs everywhere will fantasize about because it reminds them of their personalities in high school. However, soon after her introduction, her love for animals is revealed through well-done jokes in the manga, such as her writing that she desires to become a veterinarian, which shocks the students who labeled her as a shy and scary weird girl. 
She also possesses a wild imagination that none of her classmates seem to know about, considering she not only dreams up an identity for Chio's father as a giant yellow cat, but also has fascinations for how she names cats and how she believes those cats will live out their destinies. <laughs> Over the course of the series, Sakaki naturally begins finding herself within the circle of friends that makes up the main cast. This happens not due to her own actions to join them, but from the actions of the other characters who invite her on outings, challenge her to competitions, or try to coerce her into opening up more. I said before that Azumanga Daio's characters embody a specific archetype and stick to that archetype for the majority of the series' run, but Sakaki might be the only one to truly evolve and change to some degree. By the end of the series, she's found people to call her friends who she doesn't have to be shy or uncomfortable in the presence of. She even finally finds an animal to love her in the form of a rare Iriomote cat named Maya, which is fitting considering the Iriomote cat is isolated and different from all other breeds of cats. The series takes place over three years, the three years encompassing high school in Japan. And in that time, we witness the growth and experiences of our cast. Their defining personalities remain mostly stagnant throughout the years, but they all learn things about both the world and themselves. Sakaki does this perhaps more than anyone, and her place within the cast is essential to Azumanga Daio's ability to illustrate heartwarming themes within all of the comedy and absurdity. The next character to discuss is Chiyo Mihama, or Chiyo-chan, the most easy to bully of the main cast. The whole joke around Chiyo is that she's a little girl who's so intelligent that she was able to skip all the way to high school. She's the child prodigy character that is definitely no stranger to Slice of Life. However, she ends up being a bit more than merely that. Because of her towering intellect and sensibility, she ends up being the wisest of the girls and uses her strong moral compass to influence her friends. Even Tomo, the most arguably immature and brash member of the cast, admits that Chiyo is a pure and unadulterated soul. Chiyo isn't completely incapable of being not perfect, though. She's appeared to be competitive at times, especially in regards to Tomo taunting her for her low scores in gym class, and also gets frustrated when people point out how flawless her life seems to be. The introduction of her character is perhaps the first piece of absurdity to be found within the series. Her age and small stature make her an easy target for the attention of her class, and it's this trait that attracts the main cast to become her friend. Chiyo even manages to befriend the reserve Sakaki by introducing her to her pet dog Tadakichi, the first animal to not either run away from or attack the poor girl. The wisdom and intelligence that Chiyo's friends often take advantage of is juxtaposed by the girl's innocence, which is what leads to even more of her being taken advantage of. The fact that Chiyo lives in a mansion, owns a kick-ass summer home, and even has the world's greatest dog absolutely makes her a person you would very much want to befriend. Even so, you never doubt for an instance that any of Chiyo's friends have an insincere relationship with her. They support her in her shortcomings and hold a great deal of appreciation for her intellect and sophistication. While most of the girls depend on Chiyo for assistance, Chiyo is the most independent out of all of them. So independent that we never even see her real parents. Maybe she killed them both. To call Chiyo a boy and an optimistic person is an understatement. Her happy nature and inability to be impolite makes her the most lovable member of the main cast. Even when she attempts to lose her jovial attitude after hearing her friends tease her for it, all it does is reinforce her innately charming personality. No matter how much older and experienced the girls are, their personality flaws and imperfections always seem to get the better of them. And without Chiyo, their group dynamic loses its ability to hold power through the kindness elements of their friendship. Okay, I think that's more than enough talk about friendship. It's time to talk about Tomo. To me personally, Azumanga Daio cannot be the same without Tomo Takano. Tomo Takano is my waifu. You cannot steal her. I have made a legal claim to her. She is mine. And the fact that I can say that, even though she's objectively one of those loudmouthed and inconsiderate characters in anime, is impressive. Tomo has confessed to many of her less than admirable goals, among which include creating a dysfunctional classroom, being the designated annoying person in class which is what makes the arrival of Osaka intimidate her, and most of all being as loud as humanly possible while never admitting she's the reason for a state of chaos. Her ego and unwavering self-confidence is her greatest imperfection. She constantly challenges people to competitions such as races with Sakaki and great comparisons with Chiyo, yet not once does she upstage the girls she should know are naturally better than her. She's the Genki girl of the cast, and her energetic spirit and infinite drive to win and outclass her peers to no avail is a perfect formula for comedy gold. You don't want to see a cocky and arrogant person constantly win and show up their rivals. You want to see them lose and gain comeuppance for their arrogance. 
Tomo's never-ending losing streak, however, never obstructs her optimistic, childish nature and only further motivates her to try hard enough when it really matters to her. For example, the fact that she slacked off through all of middle school, only to study harder than ever before at the end of the year, just so she could pass the exams and go to the same school as her best friend just to spite her, is perhaps the greatest example of doing only what matters to you. And that's what Tomo really is. She does what she feels like doing with zero hesitation, no matter the consequences, and no matter how stupid other people say it is to do it. She wants to hold the buckets of water in the hallway, which for some is a grueling punishment, but for her is an exciting challenge. She wants to make disruptions in the class just to prevent the day from becoming too boring for everyone. She wants to make up stories purely for fun or even for the sake of preventing trouble like when she stopped Osaka from pressing the fire alarm by saying it would blow up the school. She is the source of Azudai's purest comedy by being the most unrestrained and carefree cast member, a character that isn't unwilling to act on instincts to make a scene. It's honestly kind of motivating when you look at it, considering most of us would never try to do the things we feel should be done because it may lead to undesired consequences. Or maybe I'm just looking way too deeply into this. And of course, if we're looking at Tomo's unabashed urge to do what she feels would be funny, exciting, or stimulating, we have to examine what just might be the most controversial scene in the entire series. The key scene is a situation that you can either look at with an objective perspective, or one that you can examine through the perspective of the person most people would agree to treat with disdain. Why did Tomo throw the key? Why did she think it would be funny? Why was she such a shit? Why did she ruin the whole episode? Tomo is a creature of instinct. Like when she touched wet paint for no apparent reason, and even she herself was confused as to why she did it. Was it autism? I believe Tomo herself defends her decision to a sufficient degree. In her words, these trying times will make the trip all the more memorable. What does everyone always remember about times they spent with friends and loved ones? All the bad shit that went down and ruined everyone's good time, but can now be remembered as a funny memory and be laughed at. Like I said earlier, Tomo was the catalyst for Azumangadayo's humor and is the source of some of its funniest moments. And without conflict like this, how can we expect to have a good funny time with what we're reading or watching? Tomo was not doing her friends any favors but she was doing us the audience a favor by formulating such an iconic scene. So iconic that we still debate if that scene actually makes Tomo a terrible person or not. And on another note, Chia was kind of asking for it with this line. If I were to lose this key right now, we wouldn't be able to get inside the house! I mean, what the fuck did you think was gonna happen? But what was Tomo's actual reason for throwing the key? Well, one look at the title of this specific strip in the manga gives us our answer. That's right. She did it for the lulls. <laughs> Genki girls always win. Also, Tomo mastered the spin technique way before this asshole was doing it. Yomi is fat. No, no, I, I can't do that to Yomi. Yomi is the most punished of all the Azumangas, without a doubt. Not only does she endure Tomo's antics on a daily basis, but she also can't sing, she can't pass her entrance exams which makes her even less accomplished than actual special needs characters by the end of the show, and she's also completely incapable of maintaining her diet which causes every fan of the show to constantly make fun of her weight. Her insecurity about her weight even leads her to lash out at her friends for making comments she thinks are meant to insult her, which is clearly an unhealthy mental instability that suggests Yomi needs serious help. But how about something even worse? After all the main cast makes a plan to go to the amusement park and Yomi finally starts to get excited about it, she gets sick and bedridden, leading her friends to send her phone calls to remind her of all the fun she's missing. Maximum punished. Now don't get the idea that Yomi's an innocent angel that doesn't deserve all these misfortunes. I mentioned her insecurities with weight loss earlier, but she also has the tendency to abuse Tomo physically and verbally to the point where she thoughtlessly berates her friend when she's wounded by a feral cat. 
She's also displayed signs of greed, like the time she made it apparent that she only thinks about receiving money as a gift, after Tomo asks her what she'd like to receive more than anything. Yomi often attempts to maintain a serious and mature demeanor, which is for sure a facade considering how temperamental and abusive she becomes when easily provoked. She can still be playful though, like the time she tried to POISON Osaka with spices after Osaka clearly stated she's very weak to spicy food. If that isn't sadism, then sue me because even Tomo sees that as going too far. But even with all these character flaws, Yomi still manages to be the series' ultimate punching bag. Nothing seems to ever go right for this poor soul. Ah, Yomi! Oh, Yomi, Chia, Runda! So they are. Kawaiina! So, so ka? Chia, Chia! Mini, mini! Idari, idari! Perhaps this is why she continues to be friends with Tomo, so she can act superior to someone that manages to ridicule herself through her own actions and make Yomi look better by comparison. Is Yomi actually a bad person? Not at all. She often looks out for people like Chiyo and tries to be patient with Osaka despite her more irritating tendencies. It just so happens that the whole world hates her. Seriously, even the back of the official manga is calling her fat. What kind of a sick joke is this? I guess this is what happens when you have to be the foil of Tomo. The universe becomes just another obstruction to a peaceful, fat-free existence. Some people wonder why Kagura was introduced when Tomo seemed to be the established tomboy. Well, the fact is, Tomo never really was the textbook definition of a tomboy. Mostly because she still possessed traits that kept her girly characteristics, like the fact that she wants bigger breasts. Meanwhile, Kagura is embarrassed by her massive jugs, which makes it... Kagura is designated tomboy and as history has taught us, tomboys are always a best. And even though Tomo will always have my heart, Kagura is a solid second best in my eyes. I am a fucking loser. Kagura possesses a rivalry with Sakaki, again similar to Tomo. However, while Tomo's rivalry is heavily one-sided with Tomo feeling envious of Sakaki, Kagura is much more friendly and warm to her rival and seeks many opportunities to befriend the introverted girl. She makes a concerted effort to walk to and from school with Sakaki while also defending her from the vicious cats that always want to bite her. Of course, Kagura's methods of dealing with these cats is much more violent than Sakaki would prefer, and that's where Kagura's more abrasive nature manifests itself. In fact, Sakaki's interest in cute things is contrasted heavily by Kagura's rough tomboyish personality. Little details like Kagura drawing over Sakaki's cat pictures with things like eye patches and scars, or even Kagura constantly going on about how she wants a mountain bike. Not that girls can't like mountain bikes and stuff. Kagura evidently is much different in terms of interests and behavior than Sakaki, but their friendship persists. Kagura also is much more self-aware of her faults than someone like Tomo is, and even possesses a soft side to her masculine proclivities. She tears up when it seems like it was her fault that the group's tent was ruined, a reaction that confuses Tomo who expects someone with Kagura's personality to snap back at Tomo and shift the blame. At the very end of the series, Kagura is the only character besides the emotional Chio who cries about high school being over and having to say goodbye to everything. Kagura also has a very helpful nature, evidenced by the scene when she tries to help a foreigner with his luggage, despite her poor English skills, which leads to what's actually the greatest scene in the entire show. What? Help! Help! Help me! <laughs> that helps me a lot, thanks. This girl is too good. Kagura's lack of major intelligence is another thing she's self-aware about. Her grades aside from P.E. somehow are worse than even Tomo. But unlike someone insecure like Yomi, Kagura tries to look on the bright side of things by forming a camaraderie with Tomo and Osaka on account of the three being the dumbest in the class even though Osaka is a super genius. So even though Kagura might appear to be the typical athletic girl who can't do academic work to save her life, her warm and friendly side makes her one of the most likable members of the Azumanga cast. Despite being the teacher, Yukari is essentially a student like the main girls, but with a position of power. Many like to refer to her as Tomo if she became a teacher, and I guess that is a fair belief. Yukari's one genuine skill is her ability to speak English, which is the only thing that qualifies her to be a teacher. It said that most Japanese have unique character of shame. I like that character and I'm 
proud of it very much. Generally, most of Japanese. I've seen this nature of shame prevalence. Other than that, she's pretty stupid. <laughs> Yukari doesn't even seem to want to be a teacher. It's just that there wasn't any other career option she could possibly do. Despite this, she ends up becoming indistinguishable from yet another member of the show's cast of girls due to how similar her personality is to some of them. Her laziness and lack of motivation are a stark contrast to her intense value of winning above all else. This and all of her other qualities make her what most would agree to be the worst possible role model for young people like our main characters. But I view it a little differently. Much like how Toma was a person not meant to be appreciated for her characteristics but rather for the laugh she delivers through her antics, Yukari is meant to represent many of the worst traits for a responsible adult. Much like how we learn how not to behave around kids by observing our parents, Yukari teaches her students how not to behave as an adult by acting rather than simply telling. Her shitty driving, drinking habits, and lack of responsibility are all traits our younger cast members are intended to recognize as not good, and in turn become better adults themselves. Of course, none of this is probably intentional on her part, but you get the point. Overall, Yukari managed to be a friend of the girls as much as a mentor, and it's always sad at the series end when she's the only cast member who's actually saying goodbye for the last time. The best description of her is probably Sensei-chan on TV Tropes, which classifies teachers like Yukari as more of an older sister type rather than a mentor like how teachers are usually depict- Oh hey, it's actually her, go figure. Yukari is a pretty cool, laid-back lady, but a very bad example for kids. Also, Yukari mentally scarred Chiyo-chan. That's an extra 10 points for child endangerment humor. Nyamo is the Yomi to Yukari's Tomo. Stern, serious, responsible, but also secretly a horny slut who totally boned tons of dudes in college and deep-throated about a dozen. Okay, none of that's actually confirmed. But Nyamo is definitely more than just the typical teacher who dislikes her friend's lazy attitude. Another comparison she shares with Yomi is her deep-rooted insecurities, which in her case stem from the stereotype of gym teachers like her being stupid. Nyamo consistently receives abuse and mockery for being just a simple gym teacher, and often grows depressed about it. But even so, most students, including the main cast, recognize her as the more approachable of the two central teacher characters, and the person more likely to offer help and advice. Including advice on sexual education! The penis has many other names. Cock. Dick. Dong. Salophagus. Pekka. Johnson. Anaconda. Magic Wand. One-Eyed Snake. Shaft. Lightsaber. Manhood. Wayna. Captain Winky. Meat Cigar. Python. Schlong. Member. <laughs> Love Muscle. Donut Holder. Free Willy. Yamo's generosity is another one of her best features, such as all the times her class loses the sports festival, yet she still treats them afterward, unlike Yukari who only agrees to treat her class if they win. Nyamo also seems to share Yukari's habit of relating more to high schoolers than other adults like her. Why else would these two single women agree to spend their summer vacations hanging out with a bunch of teenage girls? Nyamo is a nice lady. Although, I still really want to know what she told those girls to kill Chiyo's innocence. Kimura may be a representation of the entire fan base of the show. Because he likes underage girls? I don't, I don't know, maybe. But think about it this way. Everyone who ever loved this series loved it mostly because of its characters. Kimura loved girls presumably similar to the main cast, but not once is it explicitly stated that his love for them was sexual. It may have been slightly implied in a few spots, but he never tried to straight up sexually assault anyone. He just admired the girls for their most positive attributes, physically and characteristically, and it can be said that the show's fans felt the same way. Given that Kimura is the only major male cast member, it seems like his eyes are the eyes of the self-inserted audience. And hey, his wife is a really nice person. I don't know why Yomi feels the need to doubt her taste in men. This guy could have been the greatest husband ever, but because he can admit people like Sakaki and Kagura are attractive, he's automatically an irredeemable creeper? <sighs> this is why you don't see many male teachers in the education system. Unless, like, they're really old and don't have functioning dicks anymore. And now, an AMV from 2006.
There is simply too much going on with Ayumu Kasuga, aka Osaka. She's essentially the entire show personified into one blob of moe. I believe that Osaka meets perfectly in the middle of the Venn diagram, comparing cute and retarded. Although let's be frank, Osaka is not retarded. She's just... Eh. A person unlike any other person who ever did person things. She's not unintelligent or missing basic human capabilities. Her attention span and way of analyzing problems are far from the norm. This is what gives her an advantage in things like puzzles and riddles to the shock of the rest of the cast. It's like her brain is wired backwards. No, I'm still not calling her retarded. I'm calling her special. For Osaka, everything is an enigma. Things like the difference between an escalator and an elevator cause her great confusion, and her undeveloped reflexes give her an inability to properly assess situations. Even her body seems to be on level with her brain, seeing as she lacks the ability to stretch, run, or do any other basic athletic feats typical for girls her age. On the other hand, she has a childlike interest in the simplest of things, almost like a three-year-old discovering how a toilet works. The joy she finds in things like smacking her face in a pan full of flour is something only a very unique person can take such extreme pleasure from. She also has a habit of repeating herself over and over. Listening to Osaka talk is what I imagine it would be like to sit at a family reunion and hear your six-year-old cousin talk about their trip to the park and discuss everything they saw, but not once how they interpreted what they saw. On another note, I think Osaka might be a tad racially insensitive. Osaka and the rest of the Azumanga cast appear to be strongly anti-American, as noted by their occasional comments on foreigners and Western culture. An American! There's an American among us! Ano! Shibata! Kaijinja! Now, it's of course not uncommon for Japanese people to be slightly xenophobic, but at the end of the series, Chiyo decides to study overseas in America for college, and all Osaka can talk about is how likely it is for her to be shot. By a gun. This is quite inconsiderate for Osaka to say. There happen to be plenty of ways to die in America, other than gun violence. For example, you can also be shot by... a cannon. Anyway, back on the subject of Osaka's totally not actual mental retardation, Osaka tends to tell jokes backwards. This is another example of the girl's bizarre way of comprehending certain elements of speech, among which include her very own language. This is interesting because in the source material, Osaka is given a sort of hick accent due to her origins in the city of Osaka, which I'm led to believe is basically the Japanese version of Alabama. In the English dub, Osaka possesses a Texan accent that makes her sound like she just stepped right out of the Houston woodlands. I'm Ayumu Kasuga, and I come from Osaka. It's a pleasure to meet oh, all no, of you. Oh, no, 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 no! It's very sweet of you to be so considerate and try to speak like we do. Huh? But you can just say, darn pleased to meet ya. Is this attempting to say that all southern people are dumb? I'm southern myself, so I guess this could be true. However, there's more going on with Osaka than just her unorthodox way of thinking. She has a personality that exemplifies everything that makes Azumanga Daio as appealing as it is. All of Osaka's actions are both unpredictable and more often than not, indecipherable. We don't know why she thinks Chiyo's pigtails are detachable. We don't know why she wants to wake someone up with a frying pan. We don't know why she won't stop saying Sata and Dagi. Sata and Dagi. But that's the source of joy. Just the audience confusedly watching a girl with a sub-80 IQ doing cute things. Nobody's watching a slice of life show for answers to insightful questions or to discover some deep, thoughtful metaphor for how our real lives are taken for granted. We watch because we like seeing Osaka crack chopsticks like it's the most amazing shit ever done by humans. Now is it really a good thing to just watch a show to see anime girls acting cute? I don't really know, but is it really a bad thing? You don't go to see a comedian perform stand-up so you can get some insightful messages to make yourself feel fulfilled. You go because you want to laugh and feel fulfilled because you laughed. Osaka represents this aspect of entertainment, as does the rest of the show and its cast members. Whether they're cute like Chiyo, an asshole like Tomo, or weird like Osaka, each of the girls accomplishes their one job of entertaining the viewers by doing all the funny things you could ever hope to see. Osaka's slow demeanor and curious attitude towards everything she comes in contact with will always do a better job of making me feel joy and laughter than a series that forces its comedy through cheap gags and uninspired writing. And when a character like her is coupled with other characters possessing contrasting personalities, 
That's when the classic formula for situational comedy presents itself. Here's a sandbox, in this case a classroom. Here's some characters. Most of them have a single trait that wouldn't be very interesting on their own, but put them all together, and the way they play off each other and interact equals a jolly good time for all. I know a lot of these ideas I'm throwing out are jumbled and don't do a great job at clarifying themselves, but hey, that's just like Osaka. You're not sure what her deal is or if she really is just stupid or thinking on a grander scale than she gets credit for. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So, is that actually the big picture behind Azumanga Daioh's charm? Is it all about making you laugh at the absurd sequence of events that these silly characters are finding themselves in? Will I ever stop asking rhetorical questions and get to the point? Well, the characters are just half the experience. The other part of the series' charm is a bit more... sentimental. Azumanga Daioh's greatest achievement, for me at least, is creating and invoking the feelings a person would recall feeling back in a more innocent time. What I mean by that is the series does an excellent job touching upon themes of childhood innocence, curiosity, and the feelings of joy and warmth involved with the whole process of growing up and maturing as a kid. In simple terms, this shit warms my heart and boosts my serotonin levels to the maximum. One example of this is how during each year of the girls' high school experience, the same three events always occur. The trip to Chiyo's summer home, the sports festival, and the cultural festival. Traditions like these are the events almost every young person can say they've had a somewhat similar experience to, especially in a public school environment. The culture festivals might be my favorite segments in the series, mostly because they remind me of all the stuff that I did in school for special events that seemed completely stupid at the time, but now I can look back on as significant memories that I'll most likely never get to experience again. Speaking of which, culture and customs are a major part of Azumanga Daioh, and scenes like the girls performing annual traditions of visiting temples for New Year's, or playing games western audiences probably don't understand, is a prime example of how the series embraces the fun part of culture. The show also borrows from other cultures, which is why holidays like Christmas are celebrated in the series. The Christmas special is one of the most fun and enjoyable segments in the show, including classic scenes like this one. Merry Christmas! <laughs> but holidays aren't the only elements of the series that draw on the viewers' feelings of nostalgia and sentimentality. Episodes like the field trip to Okinawa where the girls get to be their usual rambunctious selves while feeling carefree out of their typical school environment is something I think anyone who ever had to get on a bus and leave school for a day can relate to. The theme of pets and animals is another one of Azumanga Daioh's most heartwarming features. I noted Chiyo's dog Tadakichi-san being the best dog to ever be a part of fiction, but there's also Sakaki's pet wildcat Maya, the only animal to ever return her affection. Cats seem to be one of the series' longest running gags out of all of them. There's the fact that every cat seems to have the same simplistic design, suggesting how pure they are in nature. Yet there's also the fact that every cat in Japan seems to be an asshole that likes to bite innocent schoolgirls. The series also manages to make you feel good in all kinds of ways you wouldn't even expect it to, usually by just placing the story in very comfy scenarios. What I mean by comfy is just simple settings that leave room to enjoy the little things in life. Like this scene where it's raining outside and girls have to stay at school to weather it out, or when they have to walk to school in a typhoon and Osaka is enjoying the change in weather. Little stuff like that just makes me feel happy and it's extremely difficult to figure out why aside from the fact that I too have had to do things like wait for rain to pass at school. Scenes like that pop up everywhere in the show and deliver this unique sense of comfort. The soundtrack does this job of making you feel at ease and comfy exceptionally well. I don't think it's an understatement to say that this is one of the best anime soundtracks for this type of show ever made. Each song just feels like it's what would be playing in the background of a regular school day, aside from the more upbeat and energetic ones. I've even found myself listening to these songs just for casual listening whenever I feel the urge to. It's a soundtrack that ranges from quiet and peaceful to actually beautiful works of art. It's fantastic. And then there's all kinds of other things contained in the series, like the friendly relationship the students share with their teachers, Yukari and Yamo, 
turning authority figures like educators into humanized companions. Everyone can probably attest to having at least one cool teacher who never seemed like they really wanted to be imposing or dickish, but rather they wanted to be on an even level with the students and effectively gain their respect because of how down to earth they were. No one wants to pay any mind to the teachers who treat students like mindless dipshits without any voice. It's the teachers that try to befriend their pupils that leave lasting impressions, while the douchebags that try to modify the brains and personalities of their pupils just become negative memories. Or the teacher can be like Kira and just want to jack off to the students and then just be seen as that one creepy guy who was good for an uncomfortable laugh. This student-teacher friendship concept brings me to the core part of Azumanga Daioh's appeal. The adventure of just being young. We observe these girls grow and experience new things for three years until finally we see them off into their lives as adults, leaving us to wonder how they'll use what they've learned together to reshape their fates. It also leaves us to make up our own endings for all of them. Some people like to think Osaka did become a teacher like Chiyo suggested. Others like to believe Tomo became an agent of Interpol and stopped crime to preserve justice. And others like to believe Chiyo died in 9-11. Regardless, we get to see all these characters exit childhood, something every human will have to go through for better or for worse. Yet at the end of it all, it only feels different, but really isn't. Chiyo notes how even after school is over and everyone is prepared to separate forever, the six main girls are still together like nothing changed. Friendships that hold as much meaning as the ones in the series don't simply roll over and die. They just adapt to the new environment that makes up adulthood. We see this throughout the entire series with Yukari and Yamo who behave and interact the same way they did during their own high school years, solidifying them as representations of how adults can retain their personalities without sacrificing the free spirits they had as kids. For characters like Osaka and Chiyo, the adventure of being young really is an adventure. They view simple changes like changing the floors of the school for each new year as a triumph in their student career. Osaka's natural curiosity and Chiyo's sense of wonder due to her young age is an accurate feeling of just how grand everything can feel when one is as inexperienced as some dumb high schooler trapped in a classroom. But even for our characters that find themselves trapped in a classroom, every day is an adventure. Azumanga Daioh is not a series for everybody. Some people will watch or read it and love it. Some will watch or read it and hate it and even hate the person who recommended it to them. It's all a matter of taste. And I'm not going to be one of those people who call someone out for shit taste. No matter how shit your taste actually is. I'll be honest, the only reason I'm really making this video is because some time back I told my friend I could make a two hour video on how much I love this series if I wanted to. And then I just decided to make it anyway to prove it, even if it didn't come very close to that runtime. But revisiting the series to approach it at an analytical standpoint gave me an even greater appreciation for it and just how much it's grown on me over time. It's a lot like one of those classic holiday movies you rewatch every year. It may not have groundbreaking production value or even be worthy of real critical praise, but it makes you feel happy and nostalgic for simpler times. I think that's what a lot of anime can be for a person. It's like how drugs can make you temporarily feel good and pleasurable, except anime only has slightly less health detriments. In all retrospects, Azumanga Daioh is a series that's very easy to fall in love with, due to both the quirks and personalities of its characters, the various experiences that begin mundane before dipping into the realm of absurdity like a good slice of life should, and little things like the cheerful music and the more subtle jokes that even if you don't initially understand, somehow you still end up becoming amused from. I can probably recount over a dozen times I've read the manga and found myself dumbfounded at the end of a four-panel strip because of a joke I didn't get. Lots of times this was simply due to a translation issue considering Japanese puns are a major part of the series, which obviously doesn't come out well in English. But even so, I still have to give credit to the translators for both the manga and the anime as well because even for an English dub from the early 2000s, since we all know those usually come out extraordinarily well, the dub holds just as much charm as the source material for me. It's what I watch first, and it's interesting seeing just how much fun it must have been to dub a show as bizarre as this one. You can really tell just how much passion went into localizing this series. Just look at the original DVDs. It's overflowing with soul. You got character charts, you got art models, you got slick disc designs. It even has clean, open, closed technology. This series has found a fan following that is more dedicated than anything I can think of in the anime industry. It's pretty much the equivalent of how beloved Earthbound is in the gaming industry. You either don't care for it, or you worship it more than it probably really deserves to be worshipped. In my absolute opinion, the long-lasting love for Azumanga Daioh stems from a combination of six things. Sakaki's love of all things cute, Chiyo's purity and intellect, Tomo's relentless trash talk and foolishness, Yomi's witty observations accompanied by unending suffering for our amusement, Kagura's infinite enthusiasm and tomboyish goodness, 
and Osaka's indecipherable behaviors and fascination with the mundane. Each of these characters together sets up story after story of scenarios we couldn't ever imagine holding our interest, but it's the characters and how much we love them that sells the whole product for us. We're being treated to stories that both make us laugh and touch our hearts in many instances, and a matchup like that is the perfect formula for making a product as lovable as this. The very back page of the manga gives this idea the best possible description. The best high school stories are simultaneously funny, warm, and endearing. And that's what every page and every moment of Azumanga Daioh delivers. I love this series, and I'm glad other people do too. So to anyone who has a series that they absolutely adore without really having a solid explanation as to why, don't worry, I know exactly what you mean.